Welcome to Week to Week, the political roundtable from the Commonwealth Club of California for Tuesday, September 16th, 2014. Thanks everyone for coming out to join us at the Oshman Family JCC in Palo Alto. I'm John Zipperer, the Commonwealth Club's Vice President of Media and Editorial and your host for tonight's Week to Week program. On this program, we will look at what Congress has or has not been up to in its recent mini session, the failure of the Six Californias plan significant propositions that we're going to be voting on in this fall's election. You might have heard of Tesla choosing to go to Nevada, and we'll talk about what that has to say about California's competitiveness. And we've got lots of election news to get into. So there's an old joke about the weather you've probably heard. It goes, everybody talks about the weather, but no one does anything about it. And I think in politics, you can kind of change that to everybody talks about politics, but almost no one knows what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we've brought together tonight three of the top political analysts in the Bay Area. Uh, they do know what they're talking about, and I know that they'll do so with intelligence, wit, and insight. So please enjoy, and any opinions expressed by our speakers tonight are those only of the speakers and not necessarily of the Commonwealth Club. So let's meet our panelists for today. Starting at the far end of the stage there is Dr. Larry Gersten, professor of political science at San Jose State University and also a political analyst at NBC Bay Area. He's also the author most recently of Not So Golden After All, The Rise and Fall of California. He's on Twitter at L. Gersten. Next to him is Josh Richmond, the state and national politics reporter for the Bay Area News Group. He also blogs regularly at ibabuzz.com slash politics. And he's on Twitter at Josh underscore Richmond. And next to me is Carla Marinucci, the senior political writer at the San Francisco Chronicle, where she also writes for sfgates.com, sfgate.com's, excuse me, political blogs, and she's on Twitter at C. Marinucci. So there are question cards on your tables. Please write down and submit questions. We'll have someone collecting them and bringing them up, and I'll do my best to get as many asked during today's program. Now on to our round table. And I wanted to start with this, uh, the U.S. Congress recently got back into session. I think it was, what, a two-week session or so? And uh, they had, I don't know what they were going to be able to accomplish in that short amount of time, but there's also a bit of a game here on what they can do or what they want to be able to get accomplished without making a mess in the November election. So Larry, I want to start with you. What, what did they hope to do during that session? What were their goals? Avoid stepping into it. <laughs> I mean, you've got, you've got uh, uh, an election with a lot of incumbents there running for re-election. Most of them are. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last thing they want to do at a time when you're going to have a low turnout and a rather unpredictable um, uh, electorate is do anything rash. Um, now, you know, a lot of people are going to be unhappy with that on such topics as immigration reform uh, that uh, many things should have been dealt with a long, long time ago. Uh, but, but the nice thing for Congress right now is that they've got an escape valve. And that escape valve was known as ISIS. And so everybody now can hold all these hearings. We've got to put everything else aside, you know, as if there was anything else was there. That's another story. Uh, I've got to put all our papers aside, all our, all our bills aside, because we've got to focus on, on the homeland now. And, and I think this gives them oh, just a delightful way out. And, uh, um, you know, it sort of legitimizes, if you will, their, uh, their, their lack of uh, activity on anything else between now and November. Carla, are they, are they meeting again before the November elections, or was this the final time we're going I, to? I'm not sure on that. Are they meeting again before the November elections? They've got another couple of weeks. I think so, right? They okay. have some time another couple of weeks. But, but you know, I wanted to follow up on what Larry had to say on, on ISIS, because this vote they're going to take um, this week, we saw just, just a few minutes ago, uh, Barbara Lee of the East Bay came out and said, look, I don't know enough details. On, uh, on, on what exactly we're proposing here and what's in the future, and I cannot support this. And I think when we're talking about how Congress is trying to distance themselves and try to walk the fine line for the November elections, the Democrats particularly have had some real sort of soul searching with regard to what they're gonna vote on this week, this $500 million proposal to train uh, uh, Syrian uh, uh, troops, and, and I think a lot of the people in Congress are, on both sides are saying, okay, where do we go next? There's words like mission creep and boots on the ground and so forth. Um, boy, Obama, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to distance himself from him, 
at the same time, they want to support him on this issue. And it's funny that the Republicans have sort of come forward here and said we're standing with the president, while, while people like Barbara Lee are, but, are putting distance. But, but the beauty of the debate is it was, it was precipitated by the president saying, I have all the authority to do whatever it is I want to do anyway. If you would like to vote, that would be nice. So, you know, they, they can do all the breastfeeding and hair tearing that they want, but ultimately, it's not necessarily going to affect what actually happens. Uh, so they have that luxury a little bit of, as, as Professor Gersten said, of debating this for two weeks and then uh, skedaddling back home to run their campaigns. I mean, even if they vote on something by the end of this week, which I think would be, would be it's possible. Uh, I think it's more likely it'll, it'll go over. They'll, they'll spend the rest of the time, you know, looking into this, looking into that, you know, how did we get there, what are we doing? You know, calling all these guys down who have big lots of stuff on their on their lapels and military guys and and just you know drilling in. And frankly, they should drill down. I mean, they they really should drill down. I, I think a lot of people are worried really about a rushed vote. They should drill down uh, for information. Um, I'm talking about oil drilling here. We're no, we're not. Talking, <laughs> I'm not doing the fracking thing right now. Right. Uh, but 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 seriously, I mean, this is a very uh, complicated problem here where the ally one day is the enemy the next, the enemy the, the, the next is the ally on certain terms. I'm telling you, this is a three-dimensional chess game. I wouldn't want to be in any of their positions for anything in the world because this is probably the toughest situation we've ever been in in trying to figure out what is right. I, I would also submit it probably would have behooved us to drill down and get deeper into these issues thoughtfully before there was a crisis on our plate, essentially, because uh, you know this is pro probably the worst possible time to be making you know, years or decades long policy when we're, we're staring a, a, a particular threat in the face. So people don't necessarily react as, uh, as uh, intelligently at a moment like this as they might otherwise. Do you think any of them, particularly the Democrats, are feeling a bit haunted by uh, what Hillary Clinton went through in 2008, where she was dogged by, you know, opposition to her previous votes for Iraq, the Iraq uh, war? Um, First of all, do you think Hillary Clinton is very glad not to be in office right now and having to make another vote? But do you think that's on, on the minds of these yeah, Democrats yeah, like yeah, Barbara Absolutely, Lee? I think that's what's happening. And when Barbara Lee raises some of these questions legitimately, how do we know who we're funding today uh, if they're going to turn around and be our enemy tomorrow? Um, I, I think you know a lot of folks in Congress are looking at this. There's no way to predict what's going to happen. And uh, as, as Larry said, this is such a complicated and scary uh, issue on so many levels uh, that, that none of these folks are, uh, are are risk takers in a lot of ways, and and on this one, I think they're they're running the other way. Uh, Larry, a new poll has come out showing what Californians think of Congress, and uh, you've you've talked about this in the past. What do they think, and does it matter? Thirteen percent approve of Congress. Seventy-five percent don't. And the other 12% probably want to wring their necks anyway. I mean, it is unbelievable. Uh, it, is, it is not an all-time low. The all-time low is 9%. Uh, but the last several years, it's hovered between 9 and 13%. It's very, very unfortunate. Um, and, and the interesting thing is, of course, that's a cal that was a, a, a field poll. Uh, and then when you ask uh, Californians, well, what do you think of your member of Congress? Well, it's slightly better. You know, it's 36%. They say he's doing a great job or she's doing a great job, which is down by 8% just from April. I mean, so here we are rushing toward election time. And uh, more than ever, people are perplexed. They're frenzied. They're upset. Uh, this economy seems to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, improving in name only for everybody but me, that type of thing. Uh, we, we've got all kinds of data out there that shows our standard of living is going down while corporate profits are soaring. You know, a lot of people are not too happy, and uh, they think something ought to be done, and of course we have what we just talked about, nothing being done. Well, let me ask you, you know, g given that the norm has been, everybody says throw the bums out, but maybe not my bum. You know, his historically that, that's been sort of what the polls find. But we, now we start to see this reversal where the, actually more people are disapproving of their own members than, than approving. Does that, is that problems for, for the, the contested incumbents here in California? I think, it's, I think it's going to be a problem for four or five races where they were extremely close to begin with. Right. You know, a couple of races in, in Northern California, like the uh, Ami Berra seat, 
uh, Julia Brownlee. Uh, Julia Brownlee. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the Palm Springs seat, what's his name, Ruiz, is it? Mm -hmm. Roll Ruiz. Ruiz. Scott yeah. Peters in San Diego. Right, San Diego. right. It's Peterson. Those, those are the good ones. And, uh, and, um, and then there are a couple of Republicans who are just hanging on in, in the Orange County area, and we'll, we'll have to see what happens there. But mm. I think it could be one of those times where there are some seats that change hands, although in, a, in an off year, the turnout is lower, the uh, predictability goes wacko, mm -hmm. and so things that we might normally expect during a, a presidential year, they don't occur. Right. So I think we can expect to see, we expect to be surprised. I think we'll have some of those. And, it, and this is where I think Democrats are nervous this year too, because being that it's an off year, of course, Democrats don't turn out as much. Republicans are much more motivated. Uh, they, they're, they're still upset about, about Obamacare. They, they still are more motivated to vote against Obama. And so in some of these races, particularly in Senate races, not here, but obviously across the country, uh, this is where Democrats are nervous, and we, yeah, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but we should also talk about the, the race here in Silicon Valley in the House race, and when you talk about incumbents, uh, Ponda and Kana, but I don't yeah. know if you want to get into that right now. Or sure, if, we're talking about the Mike Honda. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is the brilliance of the Republican planning, short term. Short term, for 2014, by not settling the immigration issue, Democrats say, a lot of them who are looking for a reason to come out, are going to say they didn't settle it, Shame on Obama, blah, blah, blah. Whether it's Obama's fault is another story, but, but that's who gets the blame or the praise when it comes to these types of things. And th th it's a brilliant move short term, but they will pay in 2016. They will pay in 2016 because when, when, when the turnout gets higher, that issue will turn on them, and it will turn very, very big because all those minority groups will flock more than ever toward the Democrats. So short term, Demo Republicans haven't made this, this year, I think. Let's go into the Mike Conda uh, Rokana uh, race. Uh, what have we? What's the latest in this race? I mean, this is one of the more interesting races in the state. I think. Yeah, I mean, this has been a race to watch uh, around the country, and uh, we're coming up on a debate, which I think is going to be very very a part of that in uh, at San Jose State, October sixth. Uh, look, this is a race that pits really technology against labor in a way we haven't seen before. Uh, most of the big tech. Uh, stars are with Ro Khanna, the former Obama trade representative who's never held the political office. And then Mike Honda, the seven-term uh, Democrat, is a favorite of labor. This, this pits uh, the, the sort of classic Asian-American uh, 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 ethnic uh, vote, Japanese-American with Honda, who was here when it was known as Santa Clara Valley. Uh, and, and Ro Khanna, Indian-American, a rising ethnic group, uh, who sort of epitomizes Silicon Valley. And I think it's fascinating in so many ways. It looks, we've, we've talked about this, we've debated it a number of times, and I think Khan is getting more and more aggressive in his uh, attacks on Honda as somebody who is sort of coasting in office. And we're going to see how this plays, particularly with, say, millennial voters or those tech independent or libertarian-leaning voters, and whether they'll turn out or whether labor, who, which has been a key, uh, you know, the boots on the ground in so many of these races will continue to hold its clout in this race. How, how close is the race? Uh, the last poll, I mean, in the primary, uh, Honda won by about 20 points. 20, 20 percentage points. It, it won't be that, that uh, wide a margin in November. You know, two, two Republican candidates got eliminated in the top two primary in June. Um, Kana is working hard to try to make up some of that deficit. He now has less money in the bank than Mike Honda does, which is a reversal from, from you know, the first two-thirds of, of, of this campaign where Kana came into this with a huge bankroll. Um, and of course, you know, Honda has the advantage of incumbency, so you know, Kana's holding press conferences out there. He's holding one tomorrow in Cupertino on pension reform. Uh, Honda's out there sending out press releases about bills he's introducing or co-sponsoring or you know, calling for studies of this or that and stuff like that. Um, I would think both will be on the air soon. Get ready for those TV and radio barrages that you all love so much. The, the, the time is upon us. Um, you know, probably time to start with when vote by mail ballots go out, which is actually the same day of their debate, October 6th. Um, and um, Honda is in the position of just needing to hold on at this point, you know, because he came out of the primary with that lead and with the money advantage. 
Um, the question is, you know, can he? <laughs> so. They'll never say it publicly, um, but my sense is both sides were very disappointed with that primary. Uh, the kind of folks poured a ton of money, a ton of organization. Oh my gosh, they were so well organized. Uh, and uh, I believe they expected to make it a lot closer vote than it was. The Honda folks, the Honda folks really thought they could deal a knockout punch psychologically if they scored over 50 percent. Right. They got 48. So both of them walked away saying, "Oh gosh, it was great for each of us, you know." I came from nowhere to get 28 percent, and got, this guy says I won by 20 percent. But I think both were very disappointed and nervous, right. and nervous. And I think Josh is right. I think we're looking at a six-point spread uh, come uh, come election night. And we're going to see, I think, if this is one of those tipping point kind of races, and that's what what makes this race so interesting. Um, is this is a generational contest? This is a contest that talks about changing times, and whether Silicon Valley is going to be the place. Uh, that, that really is the measure of, of where voters are and how, met, how many new voters are in the mix. Uh, we're going to see it in this race. And this is one of the places where the Honda people feel good. If you think about it, in a low turnout election, among the people who tend to turn out not as much are the young people. Although the young people who turn out the most are the old people. Well, <clears throat> more senior people. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and if you think about it, um, these people are going to stay with the one they know. They're more likely to, for all the reasons we can talk about. And the young ones, who won't be out in as great a number, yes, they may be more for Kana. So Kana's challenge is to, really, is to really get that youth vote out, that young vote out, along, of course, with prying away as many uh, Republicans, 19% of the district's Republican, Independence. Thirty-two percent of that district's independent. Does the ever-increasing percentage of voters who vote by mail help Kana in that regard in any way, or does it sort of become a wash? Well, I, I can't answer that question, but we've looked at this, this, this absentee voting, voting by mail. You know, everybody thought when we then we took this on and made it very easy to do that it would just lead to a groundswell of voting. It hasn't changed anything, and if anything, what we see is a continuous drip downward. In, uh, in gubernatorial and as well as presidential elections. So, so I, it, may, it may, something hap may happen internally, but in terms of the turnout, no. You know, and I think this is the other interesting thing for me and Josh is, I mean, this, is, it, this race also shows the strength of newspaper endorsements in the race because in both our cases, your paper endorsed Kana, mine did all, as well. Honda won handily in the, in the primary. Uh, maybe newspapers are changing in a lot of different ways, and maybe we're seeing that the, that, that influence uh, isn't there either. On the other hand, I will say that this is this is a race. It's interesting because of the organizational factor. Uh, you know, Kana has brought on Jeremy Byrd, who was a was instrumental in the Obama uh, he was campaign. was Obama's national field director. Yeah, yeah, a huge force in Democratic politics, and and he has been doing a lot of stuff on social media, and actually doing what, the same thing that Eric Swalwell did to, to win against Pete Stark, which is actually knocking on something like 5,000 doors himself in this district. That, that kind of strategy, we'll see if that's still, that you know, can, uh, can make up the difference. We'll see if that's, the real test here, you know, it's a laboratory, it's wonderful. Uh, because what they're trying to do is take an approach that worked during the presidential year and use it in a congressional election. And, and that is the real mystery. How well would it work when we've got a different dynamic, we've got a lower turnout, we don't have someone at the top carrying, carrying, the, carrying the torch, if you will. I have no idea, but that, if the Jeremy Bird team can win here, they can win anywhere. And I think a lot of people are thinking, to, that's why the New York Times has been calling us and the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, good grief, because they, they're all interested in seeing just how well that succeeds. But, but here's the thing on this one. What, what is it with the voters this year? Because the turnout is just so, was so low in the primary. What you're talking about, I think it was 17% in Los Angeles. I mean, some ridiculously low. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking saying if, if India, the world's largest democracy, can get a voter turnout of whatever, it was 80% or something, really well, how come in Los Angeles and big cities we're getting such low numbers? Why are the voters not, not paying attention? Let, not, let, let's not see. How, ma how many of you raise your hand if you're planning on voting in these November elections? 
Granted, oh, you're at a political no roundtable. So <laughs> this represents about half the state. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Good. Well, let's move on yeah. to our next topic, which is something you are not going to get to vote on, not this year or next year, and that is the uh, Six Californias plan. Uh, we're in Silicon Valley, land of uh, venture capitalists, and... Uh, and would have been the, the richest state in the country. Would have been had the, we only the <laughs> most fantastically rich state in the country. Uh, Tim Draper, of course, uh, made a big splash with his proposal to have uh, California break up into six smaller states, a number I assume he pulled out of a hat. Um, toward that end, he gathered names, and uh, when he submitted them, what happened, Larry? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> erase, erase. Um, well, he spent about, I think, $5 million, which is way past what, yeah, there are all these rules of thumb. You spend about 2 to $3 million, you pay 2 or $3, uh, uh, a, uh, a vote, a, le a legitimate signature, that is to say, to put something on the ballot, and you get it on. Uh, you know, all those people you see at the shopping centers, you know, by the end of that weekend, they practically have a new car uh, because they gathered all these signatures. Um, uh, and it, he failed to qualify. He failed to qualify, uh, which was absolutely fascinating. Somebody, somebody did, I mean, re re put aside the merit for a second. Put aside the merit. There is no reason when you're spending that kind of money that you don't qualify an issue for the ballot. There's just no reason. That, somebody, somebody walked away with a big smile, a big bag of money, and Tim Draper is looking kind of silly. Uh, uh, and, and Tim I, Draper's a newbie, or did he maybe not partner with a good Well, uh, a little of both, but I would, I would predict that this will end in litigation, but not against the state. I think, <laughs> I, I think Mr. Draper is going gonna, is gonna, to, after he investigates a little further, find that, that, that he's been had to some extent by the contractor that he hired to do this because, you know, they handed in something on the order of 1.1 to 1.3 million. They needed something about 807,000 signatures to qualify. And the projected validity rate was so low that there was no chance of, of hitting what they needed. And that means something went catastrophically wrong out there on the streets as they were trying to get these petitions signed. And, you know, as Larry said, $5 million should be about $2 million too much to get something qualified. So, you know, Mr. Draper put out the statement that he probably needed to put out last week when it became apparent that it hadn't qualified and he said he's going to go back to the registrars in a bunch of these counties and see why uh, so many signatures were thrown out when his contractor had predicted such a higher validity rate. I think that was probably a key phrase in the press release. And I think once he finds that, that uh, disparity is, is, is accurate, he's going to come back at his contractor Th pretty doesn't fast. Doesn't this go to a complaint we hear in all these ballot measures, and we've heard it this time, that the signature gatherers were actually we're making promises to people, you know, outside of Costco and Walmart, saying, "Hey, do you want to sign this?" And and it was actually an entirely different issue. I, I this has a, happened to me a million times. I, I wrote I a piece over you, the summer. Right? I had gotten yeah. phone calls from three different voters in three completely different parts of the state. Um, each of them describing the exact same lie that was told to them as they were handed a petition for this measure. They, each of them was told, "This is a petition to keep California as one state." And when they looked at it, it, of course, was a measure to break it into six. And they all managed to, you know, because I had been writing on it, they all managed to somehow find their way to me, and I wrote this piece, and I called up the contractor who hired all of these people, uh, and he said, this is the first I've heard about it, but hey, it's only three out of 1.3 million. Well, you know. This, isn't the, first, <laughs> yeah. this isn't the first time we've heard these kind of complaints, and, and I think you're right. I think Tim Draper's going to, uh, there, there's going to be some kind of legal action, but I yeah. think, you know, as, as a journalist, I know, Man, this was such a great story. It would have been fun to cover six Californias, but sure. come on. I mean, uh, Tim Draper, for all his money and, and smarts and everything, uh, could uh, never really it, explain it, why he wanted and this. And it's staff. worth noting that he was the sole donor to the six Californias committee. Nobody ever put in a dime to this effort except for him. But, but so. you know, just, just to carry this a step further, let's just say for argument's sake, that this ballot measure passed, it goes nowhere. That's right. It goes nowhere. If for no other reason, Congress has to approve a state dividing, period. Now, if they think we're already a little wacko bananas with two US senators, imagine 12. <laughs> 
and as much as we're occasionally making light of it, um, I, I think I give kudos for someone for jumping into politics in a big way. Do you think Tim Draper, A, will do more himself, in the, whether with this or other petitions, uh, beyond suing this firm? I, and B, do you think others will start to follow him? If he does, I hope he gets much better advice next time. This started out, you know, after Carla and I covered one of his earlier press conferences over in San Mateo at his Draper University, um, I, I turned to her and I said, I can't decide if this is completely on the level or if this is some intricately planned and very expensive satire on the ballot measure process. Um, and, and over time it became clear that he was dead serious about this. Uh, you know, I, 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 do, I do believe that. But man, you know, again, just such a bad idea and so poorly executed in the, in the circulation phase. Yeah, I think he has an interest in public policy. I think he needs to, to uh, think a little bit more about his ideas and find better help. Look, I, I think, uh, you know, and I wrote a story about this. I think what we're seeing here in California politics, and we're seeing it here more than anywhere else, is, um, I don't know if you want to call it marketing politics. Look, by spending $5 million, Tim Draper has more name recognition than Meg Whitman did when she ran, and she spent $140 million. Uh, Tom, whether it's Tom Steyer or Tim Draper or Neil Kashkari, it's about me going viral, getting your name out there, getting as much play as you possibly can, and you up your name recognition for whatever you want to do in the future. It's, it, and we're seeing this more and more with these wealthy candidates or uh, people who want to play in the political arena. That's the, that's the real upside of the Kashkari campaign. Not that he wins this time, but go four years out. Right. There's no incumbent. People are tired of, of the one party that's been ruling. And Kashkari says, look, I've been telling you this for four years. Now listen to me, and let's do something. I mean, I mean to me, this is, this is just the time that he's just sowing, sowing seeds. And, and whether, whether they, they sprout the way he wants another story, but I think it's a, a very, really inexpensive way for him to get an awful lot of yeah, press. Yeah, and, and you, you know, like we can get, get into the governor's race right now, and I think Larry is right, I mean, in, in the sense of no one knew who Neil Kashkari was on the West Coast. He was a darling of Wall Street for a while and was under the lights there as he was the administrator of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP. Uh, I think he kind of got hooked on that, that um, you know, uh, spotlight and came out here and didn't realize what a big lift it was going to be to become known. After spending $2 million of his own money, which is really a nothing in California, he's still unknown by 75% of the voters. Yeah. And Jerry Brown is still 21 points ahead and $22 million richer in the campaign. True, election. but I think I agree a little bit more with what Larry said in that Kashkari did manage to beat out the Tea Party darling in the primary, True. who is an office holder and uh, you know, no, notoriety or, or fame you know, notwithstanding. Um, and, and I think he's too smart Ultimately, Neil Kashkari is, is too smart of an individual to think that he was going to beat a, a governor who has this breadth and depth of experience in office, who has these kind of popularity numbers, who's had this kind of success by, by some standards you know, during his third term in office. I think he's laying a foundation for a future career, and I think if he manages to get through this final month and a half of campaigning without seeming overly... Uh, rude or aggressive or, you know, without burning any, any sort of bridges, if he comes out looking like he fought the good fight, he's in great position to run again somewhere like down the line. It seems like this is going to be a total rout, which it could well be. I, uh, I, I kind of wonder what his future would be in, in uh, elective office in California, but look, what we're looking at right now at the, on the governor's race is one of the most unusual campaigns we've ever seen in California. Uh, there is no campaign. Jerry Brown hasn't appeared in a single ad. He's not on the web, and that doesn't even cost anything. He is so cheap, he's spending nothing. And he's 21 points ahead. Uh, the guy is, I mean, he's a master. It's, it's insane to watch him out there. You know, he, he was just in San Francisco this last week, swearing in 1,000 members of AmeriCorps, the volunteer group, 
And, uh, you know, all they had to hear was, this is the man who, who basically found the modern founder of public service. He founded the California Conservation Corps before most of you were born. Uh, they, and then they went back to his resume, back, back to 71 when he was the first elected. He, he doesn't need to spend money, as, as somebody I talked to today said. I mean, he's been governing here since the earth cooled. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's all he needs. He, he doesn't need to spend money, and it pains him to spend money. <laughs> it, it hurts his soul to spend money he doesn't have to spend. And that, that raises the interesting question. If he spends half or less of that $22 million he has banked for this campaign, where does that money go? You know, this, oh. this is... His last Sutter campaign, Brown. basically, right? Go get the, Brown. The, the dog, yeah. the first dog of, of the state of California. No, and consider the kind of money we've seen in California. It's a lot of This killing. is the place <laughs> that we've seen these orgies of, you know, spending and mudslinging and, and craziness. I mean, 10 years ago, or more than a decade ago, Gray Davis was, you know, killing Bill Simon's $100 million campaign. You saw the last one with Meg Whitman and Jerry Brown. I mean, this is just nothing, and... and to watch Jerry Brown really kind of sail toward a historic fourth term yeah. without lifting a finger be, be, is, uh, because is pretty half amazing. of the Republicans I saw at the convention in March were saying, "Well, we don't trust this guy. We're not sure of his Republican bona fides. We were more comfortable with the other Republican in the race, Tim Donnelly." And the other half were saying, four more years of Jerry Brown? Yeah, could be worse." <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about some things that uh, voters will be faced with besides the governor's race and my condas race, um, and that is propositions. And, I, and in preparation, I printed out two and a half pages of various propositions. These are just the titles of propositions. Um, depending on where you live, you might have as few as just a couple propositions, or if you're in San Francisco, like I am, you've got almost a page of them. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the most uh, noteworthy or worthless ones that, that uh, you think of. Uh, Carlo, what are some of the big ones that voters well, will I be think, facing? Well, I think uh, voters are going to probably be most interested in the ballot. Uh, the water bond is really a historic uh, thing. This is $7.5 billion. He, he, Jerry Brown got both sides together on it. That's another thing he's sort of touting. And look, we haven't constructed dams in the state uh, or storage for decades. Uh, finally, uh, some of this could get done in the, in the drought. This is the time, and a lot of newspapers are already arguing for this. Uh, I think you're going to see the governor come out on it as well, uh, as well as the rainy day fund, which is another thing where, uh, uh, look, it's, the idea is to protect California in times of economic downturn, to put more money into these funds, to protect California uh, with its pension liability. And uh, these are the kind of thing, big picture items that Jerry Brown loves. But what you're going to see the most TV ads for <laughs> are Prop 45 and 46. Uh, Prop 45 is a measure to give the state insurance commissioner authority to essentially reject health insurance rate hikes that he finds are excessive. It's the, uh, he already has this authority for property and auto insurance, and, and this authority exists in certain other states. They want to extend it to health insurance rate hikes. The insurance industry is going bananas over this. Uh, they, they are putting tens of millions of dollars into the campaign against it. Uh, it is supported by the current insurance commissioner, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, as well as by uh, consumer advocates and consumer attorneys. Uh, Prop 46 uh, is a measure that would raise the cap on non-economic medical malpractice damages. It's been set at $250,000 for the past 39 years. Uh, this would index it to inflation, which would immediately boost it up over a million dollars. It would also, the measure also uh, would require random drug testing for doctors, and it would require doctors to start consulting an already existing database that's used to weed out drug abusers who go doctor shopping from one doctor to another trying to get narcotics. Again, you've got the lawyers on one side of this and the consumer advocates on, on one side, and you've got the health, the, the, the doctors and the health insurers on the other side. Put together those two initiatives, you're probably looking at at least 80, 90 million dollars getting already, spent. Are, are, they, are they past that? raised over 100. Over 100, there you go. He's, he's more 50, up on the news than I am. 58 on one and, well, maybe 100. Right. 58 on one so and 30. The, the radio ads years. have begun. The TV ads have begun. You've probably seen some of them already. The mail will start hitting your mailbox around the same time as your vote-by-mail ballots. That will be the inundation 
uh, of you know on on the statewide stage. So. Of course, newspapers and television stations love this <laughs> <laughs> because of the ads coming in well, like crazy. Television stations. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't get many of those ads know, anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think, but a lot, I think a lot of people are going to be watching this this malpractice one because of the idea of drug testing doctors was kind of tacked on at the end and, and by some accounts because it fo it, they did focus groups that showed, hey, uh, consumers love that idea, right. uh, doctors don't love that idea, and uh, that is where the, the uh, medical industry and the health industry has just been put. Well, bo luck. both insurers and, and the healthcare exactly. industry don't want to see the malpractice yeah. cap go up yeah, either. Exactly. So, so yeah. um, th that one is going to be really one to watch nationwide. Yeah. Is there a, a has there been polling? Do we know how? Yeah. There have been two polls: one in, one in July and one in August, and and the results are very predictable. Uh, in July, before the money started uh, flowing, uh, both both propositions were carrying. I think forty five, even more so, about fifty eight percent to uh, low thirties or high twenties, and and 46 by a, by a smaller margin, but, but well, doing well. And then we saw by uh, last, the end of last August, uh, it had already, they'd already flipped. And you'll see, them, you'll see them flip even more. This is not surprising. Uh, go back and think of some of the propositions in recent years to add a dollar a pack to cigarette taxes, to tax oil, uh, to, uh, to do any of these things, even for, any time you've got a, uh, someone with a stake uh, and it has to do with dollars and cents, uh, those groups uh, amass their resources and do quite well. And it, it's an irony uh, because when the initiative process uh, was begun as part of what we call direct democracy a little more than 100 years ago, the idea was that the people would have the opportunity to make laws that the legislature would not because the legislature was controlled by special interests. So now the special interests, you know, the people have bypassed the legislature but the special interest to have control of the process at, at the initiative level. And uh, somewhere Hiram Johnson, uh, the, the father, I guess you'd say, of direct democracy, that guy's got to be rolling in his grave. You know, just, it's just something else. Now, I don't think you've got it on any ballots down here in the South Bay, but in San Francisco, over in East Bay and Berkeley, they're going to be voting on something called, that's generally known as the soda tax, which is taxing non-alcoholic sugary drinks. Uh, is this just kind of the old nanny state? Yeah, this is another or? one that's very, very, very controversial. Of course, you know, um, uh, health professionals say this is this is a good thing that would lower health care costs in the long run. That would uh, sort of break the addiction that kids have to uh, to sugary sodas. Uh, and of course, small business hates this idea, and uh, huge billboards up in San Francisco. So a lot of money is going into this one as well even though it's only a couple of cents, the tax. And it's a repeat of Richmond. Richmond had this issue not too long ago, very, very recently. And, and it's an interesting coalition that comes out against it. Of course, it's the American Beverage Association. We expect that, you know. And yes, small businesses. And then you get the NAACP. And why is the NAACP opposed to it? Because it will be unfair to poor people. So suddenly, what becomes a, a David and Goliath story, it, it gets all muddled. Oh, well, if the NAACP is against it, maybe I want to think about being against it, too. I'm a good liberal, whatever. You know? and, and, I, and I think that really makes an interesting, interesting thing to watch. But I, I would be surprised if either one of them does very well. Um, statewide, it looks like the rest of the, uh, the, the propositions are, I'm not sure if they're of significance or not. I mean, something about uh, reducing the, the classification of certain nonviolent crimes to make them misdemeanors. What, what does that mean? What, what is the point of that? About 10,000 people will likely qualify for getting their sentences changed and, uh, and uh, yeah, retroactive. You'll, you'll be able to yeah, do that. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's for nonviolent crimes that have been considered felonies in the past. And uh, look, when you're talking about incarceration rates of $50,000 a year, per person, per inmate, you uh, do, the, do the math, and that adds up to a lot of money pretty quickly. And uh, we have not been able to control prison spending. We don't control it to this day. It's, uh, and unfortunately, um, not only does the state prison spending continue to go up, but now it's spilled over to the counties with the realignment program, which the counties have been asked to take prisoners, and the county costs are going up, and they're letting them out you know, early, and, and so now the parole problems are there. So, I mean, Jerry Brown can get credit for a lot of things, 
this last four years. But if anybody sits down and does a serious study, uh, the prison issues, realignment, and all that have been, I think, a pretty big problem for him. Let's move on to our next topic, which is, it involves another Silicon Valley billionaire, Elon Musk, who uh, had a different type of proposal for the state, and that was to build a, a large factory here for his electric car company, Tesla. He wanted billions in incentives in order to build it here. In the end, he went to Nevada, which uh, is where he will be putting up his $5 billion factory. Larry, let's stick with you. Does this say anything in particular about competitiveness of the state, and, and should Governor Brown be concerned? You know, um, it's a very interesting situation. The, the, the anecdotal viewpoint is, if we go ahead and give tax credits to these companies, we will get the money back hand over fist, because they'll hire people, and they will pay more taxes than we've given. That sounds great. I've yet to read a study on this, and I've been looking for a long time. There is no firm study. It's almost like if you say it so, you say it so, you say it so. It's got to be so. It's all there is to it. Okay? And it just isn't, I've never seen it. Now, I, I have seen, in case after case, two things. Uh, money spent in greater sums than people thought it would be spent. And secondly, the, 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 the payback, North Carolina, just two weeks ago, decided to abandon its money uh, that they give movie and uh, television producers, okay? Now, California just approved another $330 million, okay, and in tax credits. And North Carolina said, we're spending a fortune, we're getting nothing back. So, so they've just abandoned that. And uh, the states are killing each other uh, to get business. And in the process, what they're doing is they're giving up incredible amounts of revenue. Uh, we, we just, this, this year, we gave uh, $420 million to the defense industry that, that gets to build the next generation defense bomber here. When you add 420 and 330, the way I look at it, that's three quarters of a million dollars for just two, two examples, okay? And uh, you multiply that toward, with all the other ones, you're talking about a major giveaway. As a matter of fact, just to go on for one more second, the, 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 the share of the tax bite paid by uh, corporations today in California is around 8%. It was 12% just 20 years ago. Two, two things. One, on the film tax, I, I, I think it's worth mentioning. I, I happen to be talking with Art Pulaski, who's the chief officer of the California Labor Federation, about that exact thing today. And he's actually pretty enthused about it. You know, he said it's the only corporate tax credit, you know, the only industry tax credit that they ever felt good about over at the Labor Federation because it's actually geared to supporting the hiring, not of actors and producers, but of blue collar employ, you know, production employees. So they, they feel like it actually has a better chance of actually producing some working class jobs in, in the state. But on, on a broader note, the Tesla thing, the film credit thing, all of these things have, have, have created some really interesting divisions and talking points in Sacramento where you've got people both on the left and the right now, sort of decrying the evils of corporate cronyism, where you can go in and ask for special dispensations and favors. And then you've got a block, also consisting of people from both parties, who want to cut these special deals to make sure that Tesla makes its batteries here in California and, and the film industry you know, stops producing things in British Columbia and stuff like that. So it, it's sort of, it, it's, it, you know, wh where does the corporate cronyism start and the, and, and the, you know, the bona fide, good, productive tax incentives start and who do we give it to? It, it, it sort of blurs some of the, the traditionally very partisan lines that we've had on this in and Sacramento. In, and in this case, I mean, we actually talked to Jerry Brown on this, I mean, he, and he made the case Tesla just wanted too much. California was probably willing to give about $500 million. They ended up getting more than a billion. It came out to $1.5 million for every job they promised in Nevada, about 6,500 jobs. And now there seems to be sort of a feeling that Nevada got taken. Uh, when they look at the fine print, not all of those jobs have to be held by people who live in that state. They could come from California too. It's going to cost their film industry. Uh, money and as Jerry Brown said, we, we talked to him on Friday on this. He said, "Look, if the cars are rolling off the line, the batteries get made in Nevada. Fine, as long as the cars are rolling off the line in Fremont, we're the winners here. So wh why do we need to give away the store to them?" And I think he makes a pretty good case. Nevada is going to give 
billion dollars in tax. Now, they're not a big state in terms of their, their budget. Small budget. They're going to give $1.3 billion over 20 years. That comes out to $65 million a year, and they've committed to 20 years. Good luck. They're just going to compliment the casinos for that amount. Um, but what you're talking about, some of the strange or unexpected, perhaps, bedfellows in this, even the Wall Street Journal argued that case, that Nevada was taken, and uh, they've given away too much for this, and this kind of sounds like a deal that California might be better off. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Brown, it makes a good case, and I think uh, when, in, the, in the long run, as Larry said, the costs are very high, the jobs may not be there, and this is a huge commitment to that state. But when you say the word jobs, everybody wants to jump on, and this is the word. Play, playing poker is meaningless if you don't know when to fold your hand yeah. and get up and walk away from the table. <laughs> so, well, Very good. Uh, bef our last uh, uh, topic before we get to our news quiz is a bit of an election potpourri. Let's, let's talk about some of the, the big races, the latest developments, and maybe let's start on the national level. Carla, Hillary went to Iowa recently. Hillary Clinton and her husband yeah. went to Iowa <laughs> to serve steak. What was going uh, on? Honey, she doesn't need to come to Iowa. She's here every three weeks. I mean, she's, mm -hmm. we, we've seen her now in San Francisco uh, uh, literally every three weeks. She's coming back again uh, next month. She's going to do a big power lunch with Nancy Pelosi at the Fairmont. She packs these, uh, we've covered her now a number of times. She packs these lunches, whether it's uh, speaking to the tech groups or, and, and she's, super comfortable at them. Uh, she wins the audience over every time in Iowa, seemed to do the same where the national media went insane over her. Look, a lot of the folks who are in ready for Hillary and every time she speaks here, they're, they're out front with their signs. They're Californians, uh, whether you talk about uh, Gavin Newsom and his wife Jennifer or uh, Jennifer Granholm, uh, who's uh, at the University of California. I mean, there are a lot of power players in California who are helping her out and helping her. It will be there to help her raise money. And, um, you know, it, 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 is, it is already on, no matter what she's saying about uh, she hasn't decided yet. It's pretty clear that, that this is all, all go. All systems go. Yeah, yeah you, you just wonder um, whether there'll be some kind of Hillary burnout. Uh, and I just don't know how this plays out. It, I don't ever remember somebody being anointed for a nomination so early, so early. And um, since it's never happened, you know, we're just going to have to see whether, you know, by, let's say, March or April of next year, somebody comes up like a Jennifer Warren or, or some, uh, somebody like that, you know, and, and suddenly wows people because she's a fresh face to them. I don't, I mean, do I think it's going to happen? No. Do I think there could be trouble? down the road for her because of this? I think so. Elizabeth Warren could be the... Elizabeth Warren, Barack I'm sorry. Jennifer, Jennifer Warren's the actress, isn't she? Singer. Probably it's Elizabeth's sister, yeah. All right, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Younger sister. Yeah, do, I, 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 I think she'd love a shot at it, along with a lot of other... Look, she better run. Because, <laughs> because if she doesn't run, there are half a dozen Democrats who are likely to put out some kind of contract on her. <laughs> well, you know, they've been frozen in place for a year and a half. You know, they haven't been able to go out and raise any money. They don't dare do that. But you think of uh, O'Malley, the, the governor of Maryland. You think of Warren. You think of uh, 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 even uh, the, the Schweitzer, the, the governor, uh, former governor of uh, Montana. You know, the two people who live there. I mean, you know. And there's that vice president guy. There's, then there's this <laughs> vice president, you know, who's just watching the life go by, you know. Uh, and, and I mean, I, 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 so yeah, she, she, she better run. For that reason, you know, and, and when you, I have to say, you know, covering a lot of events with women, yeah. you really feel this um, it, this enthusiasm, this hunger for women among women, and you, there there are lots of debates that go on. I debate with my husband all the time. He's like, no, they, she, she's not likable enough for me. You, you talk, you go to women's groups, and they're they're there. And in fact, you know, when Hillary was here last time, I think uh, Joshua was telling you that uh, uh, she met with a bunch of women at the Fairmont. I mean, and when and I'm talking in the times, at a time when the world is facing all these crises, Ukraine, you know, Syria, so forth, uh, she knows all these leaders. She sat down with Putin and all the rest of them, and this is where uh, this, these women came away going, "Who else but Hillary?" And talk about a gender a, a gender gap thing. You hear women, you know, Republican women saying, "It's our time. 
It's our time. And they say it with an urgency, well, okay. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, they say it with an urgency. You know, and I think now that an African American has, has been elected, they really feel that, that it's our time. You know, and, and I, I sense that energy, and, and, and that could be just an incredible way to put it. It's a ready-made campaign slogan, right? Let's, let's make history again, right? <laughs> Two in a row. There, there was a story, I don't know if you saw it, about uh, Nancy Pelosi being either the number one or number two money raiser for Democrats. It, it just something like she's raised she's total $400 million or yeah. something like that. Yeah, she's unbelievable. She's the Energizer bunny. Uh, she's, uh, we, I saw her at the, uh, we both did, at uh, President Obama's event in uh, Los Altos Hills. Uh, it's one of the many events she, I mean, she is just out there and nonstop uh, for the Democrats, and she's going to be there with Hillary. I think it's, it's already sold out at the Fairmont, this Power Women's Lunch. Uh, boy, I mean, there, there's, there's no one like her when you watch her, whether it's at a campaign event or just a local event. I mean, the energy is is just there with her. Uh, I don't... Uh, but do you think this, is, this next cycle will be her last? I, that is... I, I, it certainly doesn't appear so when, you, no. when you're watching her. Wouldn't you think she would want to be involved in all the hoopla of 2016? If it is a Hillary Clinton... No, no, no that's what I meant. I mean, oh, you know, okay. like, like, you would think, like you, perhaps yes. fin finish with that. But then again, she's, she's made the comment recently that, uh, you know, if the Republicans take the Senate, it's the end of civilization as we know it. Um, so maybe she no, won't want to be part of that, uh, you know, and it's looking more and more like they may. <laughs> we should talk, I don't I, have I, a good I, segue I, from the end I, of the I, universe. I, I, wanna, I just want to say quickly, too, on the Republican side, you're talking about the presidential race. We've got Rand Paul coming here this uh, week, and he's been here to Silicon Valley a number of times and to Berkeley where we saw him get a standing ovation. Oh, my God. He's yes. a guy to watch on the Republican side, I think, because he, do, he really seems to appeal to this tech libertarian, younger voter. Uh. There, there's some concern among some of his supporters that he's tailoring his, his views, the views that got them excited about him, that he's starting to kind of temper some of them to fit. Obviously, he has to run in the Republican primaries. Is this, do you see that? Is that? That's the problem with running in a primary, is you have to tailor your views. You know, you, you, it's all well and good to say that you're the maverick and you're going to sort of buck the thing. But, I mean, you know, yeah. look, look at, look, uh, for example, look at, at the John McCain of 2000 and the John McCain of 2008. You could argue that those were radically different John McCains. I, I think Rand Paul knows that, that uh, to carry certain states, he needs to, 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 to carry a little bit of water. So... He's like a 33 RPM record that's playing at 78 speed. He is changing so fast, uh, particularly on foreign policy, it's unbelievable. I mean, this guy was just as isolationist as you could imagine, and, and now he almost is, is volunteering to go over to the Middle East. I mean, I mean he, he has really changed a lot, and I'm not so sure that uh, the neocons may like that, but I'm not so sure that the libertarian types who really don't like our government going into every place and doing everything, his base are going to be really happy with him. So I, I'm not so sure that he's doing himself much good. Could we talk a bit about the uh, state, uh, the California Secretary of State's race and what's recently happened with uh, the uh, announcement about the current holder of the office talking about her depression that she's been dealing with? This has become a very personal and and kind of troubled political issue, too. So, Carla, can you yeah, first of all is, explain... This is a really unusual that. story that uh, just broke out two weeks ago in which the Secretary of State, Deborah Bowen, coming on the sort of the heels of the Robin Williams story, yeah. uh, sort of admitted uh, being in extremely deep depression. Uh, the LA Times uh, had a, a very revealing story about her living. She's living in a trailer park. Uh, they they uh, mentioned her belongings in, in the back of her car in cardboard boxes. I mean, it sounds like she is really going through a tough personal time, maybe separating from her husband. But, but it raised a larger question. Uh, well, Democrats came out and, and sort of hailed her as somebody who was courageous to speak about a, a very personal issue about mental health. At the same time, the, the performance of the office has been an issue now. Uh, this, is the, this is the office that manages the elections for 17 million voters here, the largest group in the country. and business registration and other things that are, that are really critical to the way the state Can operates. Candidates from both parties had, had already been criticizing the, the non-performance of the Secretary of State's office after, you know, for the past four to six years. 
And I, I think this, this story that just broke sort of provides some explanation. She hasn't been going to the office on, you know, and she, she contends that she can do a lot of the work she needs to do by phone, but she is at a point, you know, wrestling with her, with her personal demons that she is not physically there in her office to do the job, and that may explain some of the inactivity on things like voting technology, uh, updating the database by which we track campaign finance, uh, creating a, a statewide voter registration database, which is, you know, it's uh, lo long overdue and over budget. All of these things that, w that we've essentially fallen behind on, you're hearing both the Democrat and the Republican in the race now, and pretty much everybody who was in the race before the primary talking about the need to actually get that office moving again in, in some sort of meaningful way. Yeah, I hear this every time that there's a vacancy in that office, irrespective of Bowen's issues. I mean, that office has been just moribund for a quarter of a century. It's pathetic. I mean, it doesn't even, they should take, get rid of it. Make it a point of office, that's all there is to it. Like a lot of our statewide offices, we don't need them. You know, nobody knows what they do, and, and, and a tremendous a duplication, you consider the treasurer and the controller and the board of equalization, excuse me, lieutenant governor, who is he? Gavin Newsom asks that himself every day. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, we could streamline this state in so many ways, but I, I think we have to be careful when we talk about someone like Gavin Newsom only because... Bowen. Uh, Bowen, sorry, <laughs> Gavin. Uh, uh, but but uh, because, y y you know, it's sort of like we're, we're picking right now on a defense, defenseless person who's not running for re-election, right. who's on her way out anyway, and, and, and uh, I think people will be wise to just let that one lie. The difficult question, though, that could still be asked, maybe not of her then, but of some of the other Democrats in state in Sacramento, is shouldn't they have done something to try to, A, get her help, or B, help run that department that was apparently underperforming during that well, time? We don't know that they didn't necessarily. You know, if they were we trying don't to know, keep know that, it that they wraps. didn't, and the fact of the matter is, look, Elected officials are like the rest of us, and a lot of them have those types of issues, whether it's drug addiction or alcoholism or philandering or whatever else it is. They are as imperfect as the rest of us, and uh, you know, if we start asking why didn't they do anything about Deborah Bowen, <laughs> the next question is why haven't they done anything about anybody else? Right. Um, it's difficult. It's very difficult. I think, I think a good question is at what time do we take um, uh, positions toward uh, looking into possible removal of a person who does not live up to the ex expectations of the office. And that's a whole big can of worms. Uh, then quickly before we move on, uh, one of the juicy questions is what happens to the U.S. Senate, as you mentioned. Um, there's been some interesting stuff going on in, in the Kansas Senate race where uh, you may have seen uh, the Democratic candidate actually dropped out of the race, though might still appear on the ballot. The independent candidate is now, I believe, leading in the polls over the incumbent Republican. Does this change the game plan or the expectations that the Democrats might still hold on to the Senate? Does it? I don't. I don't. It, it looks. It's not looking good for the Democrats to hold on to the Senate. Whether I, in most of the many of the contested races, you're talking about districts uh, where the Republicans. Have an advantage where they where they Obama didn't win these districts and in in the midterm elections as we know, Republicans turn out more than Democrats. They as we said they're more motivated. Uh, so every sort of uh, um, odds maker out there, including the the 538 blog, which really tracks so many 10,000 different polls, uh, is now giving it a 65 percent chance um, that the Republicans will take the Senate. And Agreed. I think that's a, a dire yeah, right. sign for the Democrats. Yeah, that's about right. I think, I think it's a very, very uh, fluid issue right now. You, you can turn it in one or two states, but you know, if, you, if I have to you know, bet a quarter today, yeah, but tomorrow it could be different. Um, I think the bigger issue is I think this is more a psychological victory than anything else because to get anything done in the Senate, anything of, of significance, it takes 60 votes. Uh, now, now, the Republicans will have a leg up on things like judicial confirmations because they've changed the rule and all that. And that's where the Democrats may, may uh, regret uh, changing the filibuster rule. But, but otherwise, um, it, it will hurt. Uh, and some Democrats may actually 
how can I put this, uh, may feel a little happy about it only because it, it's their reason to get rid of Harry Reid. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, he's been around a long time, and, uh, and you know, uh, he, a lot of, some people are not happy with, with his leadership, as happens with, with anyone in leadership for a long time. Sure. Well, very good. We're going to end our roundtable there and go into our news quiz here. Is Jim here? Jim is my, uh, uh, I'm calling him my prize genie. He's going to deliver the prize. What I'm going to do, there's the bag. <laughs> our high-tech system here. I'm going to ask a question. If you think you know the answer, please raise your hand and I will call on you and say it nice and loud. If you get it correct, you're going to win a nice bag of Girardelli chocolates. So fresh from San Francisco or whatever country they're made in, I don't know. Okay, so the first question. Uh, President Obama came under fire from his own party for delaying executive action on what issue? Sir, in the white there. That's right, uh, immigration reform. <laughs> um, Next question, Ukraine officially signed what long-anticipated agreement this week? Did you see this story? Uh, in the back. Uh, no, though that certainly is long-anticipated. Sir? That's correct. It's a, it's a trade and political association pact with the European Union. Uh, Jim, the gentleman there our second winner. Um, why has Toronto's controversial mayor, Rob Ford, dropped out of his re-election race? In the back, sir. <laughs> That's right, he has cancer and is in apparently very serious condition and his brother is going to run in his place, Best so. mayor ever. <laughs> Okay, Radisson Hotels, familiar with that chain, they just dropped their sponsorship of the Minnesota Vikings over continuing allegations of child abuse by whom? Do you know the name? And sir, I saw your hand first there. Adrian Peterson, a running back there for the Vikings. Okay, a new study shows that Fox News aired nearly 1,100 segments devoted to what controversy? Ma'am, way in the corner there. Benghazi, Benghazi that is correct. <laughs> uh, let's see how, uh, well, this is Silicon Valley. So despite record iPhone orders, Apple is facing, facing a backlash from another thing it did last week. Why are customers mad at Apple? And sir, I saw your hand right up there. Uh, no, actually. A ma'am in the back. That's right, they gave, uh, a free U2 album to everyone, and they put it right into their iTunes uh, library, and this has upset so many people. Apple was forced to create a special website where people can go to learn how to remove the album. <laughs> Who is Alex Salmond? S-A-L-M-O-N-D, Alex Salmond. Sir, in the white. First semester of right. Yeah, it's your, I believe your second win of the night. <laughs> okay, let's give it to whoever can answer. What, why does it matter? Who, what is, why is Alex Salmon in the news these days, ma'am? That is correct. Under <laughs> chocolate. Um, who banned the teaching of evolution in schools this week? Did you see the story? Louder, louder. That is correct, <laughs> right here in the corner. ISIS in uh, the city of Mosul in Iraq. They, by the way, just for good measure, they also banned classes on art, music, history, literature, and no surprise, Christianity. So, Islamic State, ISIS, ISIL, they're kind of a target right now. Um, presumably all those Fewer classes will give them more time for, I don't know, interpretive <laughs> dance class or something, whatever they wanted to do. Uh, let's do one more, and uh, I think many people will know this one. 
a birthday party devolved into a brawl involving what famous political family? <laughs> Ma'am in the white at the back there. Uh, with your hand up. Sorry? It's the Palin family in Alaska. Yes, that is correct. We will have more news quiz, news quiz questions and, of course, so much more to discuss on October 13th in San Francisco at our next week-to-week -week political roundtable at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you to our panel, Carla Marinucci, Josh Richmond, Dr. Larry Gersten. Thanks to all of you for coming out here tonight and everyone watching on TV and listening online. Have a great week. <laughs>